everyone. Happy Black History Month from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. My name is Arielle and I am so happy we will be learning together today. This month we are celebrating and learning from Black nature lovers and explorers. We are going to start our program by talking with a couple of special guests who will be visiting with us. And then we'll do a little art project inspired by something we learn. If you are ready, give me a thumbs up or two. We're celebrating somebody today. Let's see who. In our world, there are so many beautiful and amazing things to discover, to explore, to learn more about, from big things like trees and mountains and oceans and elephants to small things like flowers and birds and rocks and insects. The world is an amazing place. Today, we are going to meet a couple of really cool people who help our environment, who help our world through the work that they do with bees. Let's meet beekeepers, Timothy and Nicole. There they are. Hi, Timothy. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for joining us today. Awesome, thank you for having us. We're super excited to be here. <laughs> um, Timothy and Nicole are joining us from Detroit, Michigan, where they are beekeepers with an organization they founded called Detroit Hives. Welcome to Learning Together. Awesome, thank you again for having us. Yeah, we are really excited to meet you and learn from you as well. Would it be okay if I ask you some questions? Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So friends, I am going to ask our beekeepers, Timothy and Nicole, just a few questions first. And as we learn from the, them today, you may have more questions or things you're curious about. So make sure you send those questions and comments um, to us in the chat. And then I'll read those for Timothy and Nicole a little bit later. All right, let's just get started. I want to know what do you two do as beekeepers? What do beekeepers do? That's a great question. For first and foremost, we operate a nonprofit called Detroit Hives, in which we transform green spaces into bee farms and into beautiful flower gardens. Some of our tasks include educating the next generation on pollinators, inspecting beehives, and harvesting honey while also planting native wildflowers to, buy, to provide food for bees. We also are in 29 locations supporting the health of over 4.5 million honeybees. Oh my goodness. So you are helping your community, you're helping honeybees, you're helping folks learn how to do beekeeping. I really like that you are doing it yourself and teaching other people how to do it. Absolutely. Um, we get others involved to volunteer to create a social, environmental impact in our communities. Yeah, that's awesome. But so, okay, so what you're doing, I think it's really important, but could you tell us more about why bees are so important? What do they do? How do bees help our environment? Bees are so important. But first thing, I want everyone to think about their favorite fruit, right? My favorite fruit is blueberries. And my favorite fruit is watermelon. Ooh. So without bees, we wouldn't be able to enjoy these types of fruits um, because bees are responsible for pollinating some of your favorite fruits and vegetables. Um, one third of our foods are pollinated by bees and beneficial pollinators. So other pollinators include like butterflies, ants, bats, birds, and other um, mammals as well. Yeah. Yeah. So what is pollination, you may ask? Pollination is when pollen from one flower is transformed to the next flower. But how do bees play a part in pollinating? Honeybees are amazing pollinators because they have so many tiny hairs on their body that they can transform po pollen from one flower to the next. Um, honeybees also eat pollen and nectar from the, from the flowers. It's a part of their diet. Um, they collect pollen by placing it on their hind legs. And we call this pollen baskets. And they hold that and bring it back to the colony. If the colony, I mean, sorry, if the bees have found a really great source of nectar and pollen, 
they began to do a dance and a figure eight. And this figure eight dance lets the bees know exactly where that great food source is for them. So they do what is called a waggle dance. Ooh. So a waggle dance is kind of similar to when we eat something that's really good. And sometimes we do like that little waggle dance when we eat. So bees do the same thing. So I would love to see everybody or take a time to do the waggle, waggle dance. The waggle dance. So next time you think about eating your favorite fruits and vegetables, thank the bees, but also do that waggle dance. <laughs> I love that what we, we may not really realize it, but they're doing like so much work and they're dancing and working. Like, I like that those two things can go together in the bee world and it should be going together in our world too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so also with the waggle dance too, the faster they do it, the closer it is to their food, the closer they are to the food source, to the yeah. hive. And this is one way how they communicate with each other. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's really awesome. And one thing I just wanted to um, confirm or clarify for our friends is that so every fruit and vegetable, when it's growing outside, it has flowers with it, right? Like the plant. So we may not when we're eating a blueberry or a watermelon or um, let's see, my favorite food is like um, I like nectarines, but like even on the trees and the plants, there's flowers and that's what the bees are pollinating. Awesome. Yeah, and then the yes. flowers and things turn into the the fruits and vegetables that we're enjoying, right? Yeah, once the bees assist okay. the pollination, then that flower starts to develop into that fruit or vegetable. Okay, okay, awesome. So, I think it's pretty amazing that something so small can make such a big difference in our world and in our lives every day. I mean, food is really important. Um, but what's another cool thing about bees that you think people should know? Oh, wow. There's so, so many cool many. things. <laughs> so many cool, cool things about bees. I will share one thing. Bees have five eyes. So they have two large mm -hmm. eyes on their face called compound eyes, which okay. are made of 6,900 tiny lenses called facets. And they yeah. have three eyes in a triangular pattern on top of their head right on top of their head, called simple eyes. Their simple eyes serve as a natural GPS system, helping bees orientate themselves to the sun's position for navigation purposes. With the special vision, they can see unique colors and ultraviolet colors and shapes and in patterns. But this information would not be possible without the research of Dr. Charles Henry Turner. Dr. Charles Henry Turner, he was the first to discover bees can see shape and color by just observing them by sitting at a park while eating a delicious peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And there's a reason why Dr. Charles Henry Turner was sitting in a park and observing these uh, flowers and bees and insects. It's simply because he was um, turned down to work at universities that he graduated from because of racial discrimination. Um, so at the time, Booker T. Washington had a school called the Tuskegee Institute, well known as Tuskegee University today. At the time, he didn't have enough money to um, hire him as well as um, Dr. Charles Henry, I'm sorry, Dr. George Washington Carver. So as a result, Dr. Turner spent so much time in his early academic career moving from high school to high school before he settled at the age of 41 at Sumner High School in St. Louis, Missouri. He remained there until he was 55 years old. So he spent all of his time studying in parks. Can you imagine taking your time off of work and or your lunch break during the summertime, sitting down, enjoying nature, actually paying attention to what these bees are visiting. So it, he discovered that they can see shapes and colors just by sitting and observing them in a park. And guess what? Tomorrow is his birthday. Or what? Is it B -Day. B -Day. So Charles oh Turner was born February 3rd in 1867 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Let us all oh, wish Dr. Charles Henry Turner a happy B Day. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I did not know that. Oh, happy birthday. 
Wow. I think that's a Charles Henry Turner. Yeah. That's so really cool. Seeing shapes and colors. That is so cool. Let's take another look at the way that he, um, or the way that bees see colors and shapes. If we can do that really quick. I want to give our friends just another second to look. Let's go one more um, back. And something that we're seeing here, um, and um, Timothy and Nicole, please jump in for sure, is that the way that bees are looking, like, so Dr. Charles Henry Turner, he took time to watch and notice the way they were interacting with the flowers and things like that. And he, and something kind of told him, they must see things a little differently than we do. And so I think that when we look at something like this, like a dandelion, which is one of my favorite flowers, um, they are seeing the center part of it like a well they're seeing the whole flower a different color but the center part looks like it's red oh. and i'm wondering if that is that the part where maybe a lot of the the pollen or the things that they need is in this is in that part yeah so in the center of the flower is the um pollen okay also, okay um flowers communicate with bees too so if they need to replenish their nectar they'll change in color. So uh, to let them know like, hey, I need some time just to replenish that nectar because maybe a previous bee that was on there retrieved that nectar from that flower. Okay, so yeah, they're letting everyone know I'm not ready. I don't have enough nectar yeah. for you yet. Okay. <laughs> and also the nectar serves as a way to entice the bee for the flowers to get pollinated. So it's like a sweet treat So um, for them. So the flower let them know like, hey, I have this sweet aroma come help me with this pollen so we can transform it to a, the same exact flower so it can grow in abundance. Wow. You know, that's... bees have a special type of vision than we do. They have a vision where they can see things in the UV, ultraviolet light spectrum. Okay. So they, they see unique colors that we can't see with our eyes, but bees can detect them. And that's what attract bees to visit flowers with their colors and the scent. And so then, yeah, so it's like, I think this is why our plan is just so amazing is how everything kind of works together that the everything has a purpose the colors and the smells um then t communicate to the bees and the bees help the flowers and the flowers help the bees and the bees help us um okay let's look also at the shapes and i thought this was pretty cool because it kind of shows us that um that what you were saying how dr charles henry turner noticed that they also can see they may not see it exactly the way we do not just in the colors but in the little bits of kind of looks like pixels in a way that they might be seeing the flowers too yeah, yeah. so with a large two compound eyes comprised of six thousand nine hundred tiny lenses it somewhat gives them that that hexagon type of view that they see there. And they can recognize, over time, they can recognize our faces, our voice, and our scent. Yep, so when we're working in the hive, I like to talk to them, maybe read to them. They get familiar with my voice, they get familiar with my scent. Um, and so they get we get to know each other. Wow. Yep. So we they all become so family. Smart. Right? That's amazing. <laughs> that I. Thank you so much. This is, this is just so, so cool. Okay, let me ask you one more question. Um, all right, so I think I, I love bees now already just by this conversation with you all. How can we help bees? What can people do in their communities wherever our friends are here with us um, from today? Um, what can people do to help bees? That's a great question. I'm glad that you asked. Everyone can play a role in helping bees and supporting pollinators in their community. And here are several ways others can help. First is through education. We can help others educate. We can help, we can educate others on the importance of bees and their role in pollination. We can also teach them about the different types of bees, their life cycle, and the benefits they provide to our ecosystem and fruit production. We can also create what's called bee-friendly gardens to serve as critical habitats for pollinators and this will provide local groceries for bees in form of nectar and pollen. We can use natural pest management systems instead of using harmful chemicals to spray on our lawn or garden. And this that affects bees or other pollinators. So trying to avoid those chemicals that affects our bees and pollinators. We can also build native bee homes and place them in our gardens to provide local food and shelter for solitary bees as well. 
also on that too with the local bees and the native mm-hmm. bees. So Michigan is actually home to 465 different species of bees. Different bees like bumblebees and leaf cutter bees and mason bees, bees and cuckoo bees and orchard bees. Yeah. And longhorn bees <laughs> and sweat bees. The the list goes on. And then in the US, we have about 5,000 different species of bees. And in the world, 20,000 species of bees. So I would like for you all to figure out how many native bee species exist in your state. Yeah. As well, you can support by supporting local beekeepers by volunteering or attending local beekeeping events. Also, we can purchase honey beeswax and products from our local beekeepers. We also welcome you to be a bee ambassador, encourage others to take action to protect bees and create habitats, maybe writing letters to officials or participate in the community cleanups or support initiatives to ban harmful chemicals or create natural ways to create pest management as well. By actively engaging others in bee conservation efforts, we can foster a sense of environmental stewardship and empower the next generation to make a positive impact on the world. Also, another thing to add that you can help with bees is bees get thirsty on their flights. So we would love for you to create in your gardens or at your home is somewhere where bees can get a source of water. So you can pick up or grab a little uh, shallow bowl, place some uh, rocks, Marbles. Marbles, pebbles inside. Don't fill the water up all the way because bees are great flyers and not great swimmers. So when you place those rocks in there, it gives them a chance to land and actually drink the water. So they get thirsty on those foraging flights when they're looking for food in the summertime or in those warmer climates. Yeah, I would not have thought of that, but I guess, I mean, that makes sense. Like every living creature needs some water to kind of keep them going and keep them hydrated. And bees are going all all over the place all day, right? So yeah. they they definitely need that. Um, yeah, bees can I, fly for six miles. Honey bees. Honey bees can fly for six miles. Um, wow. Three miles from their hive and three miles back or more okay. looking for food. But you don't want them to go in too far because then they'll tire them out. They burn their wings, wings out. out. Yeah. Really? Yeah, but oh some day bees. Yeah. <laughs> but some <laughs> native bees only fly short amount of uh, limbs. So that's why they like to have those native bee homes close to the garden so they don't have to fly so far. Wow. There is so much. I, we have learned so much from you all today. Like, I... I, I, and I know there's even more. Um, so thank you so much for answering my questions. As you've been talking, we've been getting a bunch of questions in the chat. So I'm going to read some of those for you all um, okay. because you have got folks really curious today um, how they can learn more. So let's see. Um, ooh, a lot of great questions. Um, one question is how long do bees live? Great question. Yeah. So with our honeybees, so it depends. So inside of a colony, you have one queen bee, thousands of worker bees, which are all females. And then you have hundreds of drones. Drones are the males. So with the queen, it actually takes her 16 days to emerge from her cell, but she can live up to three to five years. For our worker bees, um, it takes them 21 days to emerge from their cell. But they only live up to four to six weeks, possibly eight weeks um, during the active season. So what I mean by active season in those warmer months. So for here in Michigan during our summer months, but they live longer um, in the winter time. So right now, because we're in the winter, what bees are doing now is clustering up. They have the queen sitting in the middle. They'll vibrate their wing muscles and they'll create a heat source. And it can be up to 90 to 95 degrees within that cluster. And they're keeping that queen warm. So the ones on the inside will uh, come back out. So it won't take. So everybody gets a chance to stay warm. And then it will shift as the cluster to eat honey. So honey is their store of food. So they could live a little bit longer in the wintertime because they're not working as hard. They're just maintaining the temperature and eating food. Okay. Now on drones, it takes them 24 days to emerge from their cell. But their life expectancy is dependent upon if they mate with the queen. Once they mate with the queen, they immediately pass away. 
So, um, and then also if they don't get a chance to mate with the queen, once we approach the fall, those worker bees begin to kick them out. And that's because those drones don't do any work. All they do is mate with the queen. <laughs> And they were taking up honey. space. Yeah, so they're taking up space. So they will actually kick them out the hive. And if they try to come back, they'll bite their wings off and discard them. So they, they're not in the hive during the wintertime. Oh, my and goodness. Because, and also, drone bees don't have stingers. So they don't protect the hive. They don't go out collecting and bringing in food. That's the job of the female worker bees. So some folks are wondering also if the what happens if the queen bee dies? How do they get another one? Great question. <laughs> um, so these bees are so resourceful. Um, so the queen, excuse me, <laughs> the queen bee can lay up to almost 2,000 eggs in one day. Um, so those <laughs> queens, so her uh, fertilized eggs are female. So with those eggs in the first three days, if they are lacking a queen or if that queen is getting older or she passed away, the worker bees will select those eggs in the first three days and begin to feed it um, for the rest of its life royal jelly. And that's the diet of a queen. And it's actually secreted from the top of a worker bee's head and it is fed to the, the queen. So those eggs are fed royal jelly until she hatches at 16 days. If she, puts a, if she hatches um, at the same time because they will raise several queens, that queen will have to like fight. Yeah. 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 Fight to see. There can only be the one queen, queen bee. Okay. Um, whoever <laughs> wins that battle becomes that queen. If she emerges on her own, she will go throughout that colony getting rid of those would be queens. But okay. we as beekeepers, we can save those queens by removing those and placing them into a brand new hive. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I think that, that that makes sense in the in the in the bee world that there can only be like one person in charge or one queen bee. But we know that we can use the bees. You all are helping bees start to start other hives, but then also in our human world, um, a lot of us can be queen bees. Um, right, but the queen <laughs> bee actually they work as a democracy, so that everybody works together for the greater good of the colony. The queen um, has to depend on those worker bees to feed and clean her because she can't feed or clean herself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a, a handful of questions about <laughs> being stung by bees. Um, yeah. And we people want to know, how do you not get stung by bees being beekeepers? Um, yeah. Why do they have the stingers? Like, does that help? Someone's wondering if they have, if it's helpful to pollination and um, why do bees die when they're sting after they sting somebody? Exactly. So, honeybees will only sting you when they feel that their hive is threatened. So they will only sting you if they feel like th there's a threat to the colony, but they will sting to protect their colony by any means necessary. Yeah. So um, like you said earlier, those bees get familiar with our voice, our uh, face, and our scent. So over time, um, they'll let us know like, hey, if we're working inside the hive, we might be working too long. So what they'll do is they'll fly into us. Or as I'm working in the hive, they're pretty calm and quiet. If they begin to buzz a little bit louder than I know, they're probably getting irritated and things like that. <laughs> Excuse me. But we also wear protective gear. So we wear beekeeping suits as well. And then we also use a particular tool called a smoker tool. Oh, yeah. um, and that is used to calm the bees down. And then it... oh. Um, and how it works to calm the bees down is in three different ways. We place dry herbs like lavender, uh, mm -hmm. dry pine needles, and it serves as aromatherapy. It smells really good and it keeps them calm. Two, the smoker tool works to uh, cover up the smell of guard bees. They emit a smell or pheromone that smells just like bananas. When we use our smoker tool, it masks or disguises what will be banana smell so that bees will allow us to go inside the hive and inspect or strike honey as we need to. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. We have a bunch more questions. Um, another question folks were asking, which I was like, this is a really, really important question is what happens if bees go extinct? Why don't why don't we want them to go extinct? And why why do we need to help them and take care of help take care of them? Well, as we mentioned earlier, my favorite fruit is is watermelon. 
And mine's is blueberries. To many others, you may have apples, strawberry, oranges, and many hosts of vegetables and fruits, but also food for animals and mammals and etc. Without bees, we wouldn't have those favorite fruits and vegetables or nuts. Or many animals or mammals wouldn't have anything to eat as well from the clovers or many of the flowers that, that blossom mm. as well. So they're responsible for close to uh, one third of our food production. So without bees, we wouldn't have none of the healthy fruits and vegetables that we see in our grocery stores. Yeah, so our produce section would pretty much be eliminated um, without the help of bees, but not like only us, but it's us or other insects and animals that also need the help of pollination. So those fruits and vegetables and plants can grow for them as well. And that will also drive the cost of food skyrocketing up. You know, the cost of food will be uh, drastically increased because there's a shortage of bees or pollinators. Yeah. So insects are great pollinators. We're not that great. We're pretty big. So even if we use like a brush to try to help with pollination, it might not help that fruit uh, develop as much as it would be if the insect, like a bee, a butterfly could help pollinate it. We, I mean, it just sounds like we really, really need um, bees. <laughs> we need, we, we need them. Um, yes. Okay, with our last couple of minutes, I'm going to ask just, let's see, maybe one more question. Um, and actually, I'm going to ask two more questions, and we'll see if we can do them really quick. One, how fast do bees fly? Someone was wondering, do bees fly 20 miles per hour? Is that true? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's definitely correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. They fly that yeah. fast. Okay, so that you got your miles. answer. Um, yeah, and they can, they can fly up to six miles or more looking for food. Okay, and yeah, so they need to be kind of fast yep. to be able to do that. And that's with honeybees. Yeah. And then how big does a hive usually get? Like how many bees can be in one, but then also like size-wise? So a colony can grow up to 60,000 bees with just one queen bee. So it depends on how um, those bees are working and if they have a great source of nectar and pollen nearby. So as the hive is getting bigger, we'll add additional boxes uh, on top of each other to give them space to uh, grow inside the colony. Okay. So it depends. Yep. But well, we've seen hive boxes grow as tall as four to five feet tall. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Okay, wait, we have one more question because it's been a few questions about this one. So I, this is our last, I'll be our last question. Um, are bees and wasps friends? And are wasps important? Um, people are wondering about wasps and like hornets and stuff. Are those the same thing as bees? In a way they are because they're both pollinators. And a pollinator okay. is anything that can help transport seed from one flower to the next. But they okay. have different types of characteristics. Yeah, so um, they're two separate species. Okay. But for wasps, their diet is different. They tend to eat other insects, whereas honeybees or bees, they eat nectar and pollen only. So sometimes you'll see them going inside hives or they will eat other insects yeah. or sometimes they'll eat bees. Um. So yeah, so sometimes they don't get along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds food. like yeah. if you're gonna be going in someone's house <laughs> to kind of eat them, they you might not get along with another mm -hmm. creature that does that. <laughs> right. Um, okay. I have to say a big, 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 big thank you so much for joining us today and for all that you do for bees and our planet. We learned so much um, and friends, we will share with you, we've shared with you some information in the chat of how you can get in touch with um, Timothy and Nicole later. Um, but for now, let's please give them a big round of applause for joining us today. We are just so thankful um, that you all came today. <laughs> um, of course, thank you. Yeah, again, thank you for having us. And I hope everyone learned a lot about bees and ready to get things yeah. planted this spring. And continue to learn and share the information about bees. With others. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. We hope you all have a great day and we will see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us.
Thank you. Thank be you. well. Be well. <laughs> it is officially our art time. I am just like, I am in such a happy, buzzy mood from learning from our beekeepers today. Um, we learned so many things, so many, so many things, um, including how important flowers are to bees. Um, so our art for our art project today, we'll be making a collage of flowers. But before we begin, let's make sure we have everything we need. Get my table all set up. Okay. All right, so as you can see on your screen there, we have a bunch of different supplies. Um, you are going to need a blank piece of paper. Um, that'll be what we do our collage on. And then you may have, oh, before I, I have to tell you what we're even making. We're gonna make a collage that kind of looks like this. Yours will have whatever flowers you wanna have on there. Um, but in order to make this, you are going to need that blank piece of paper, and then you might have either colorful pieces of paper with you today. I have some red and yellow and green and blue. That. Or I also brought some magazine pages that I tore out that has like all different colors on them too. So you might have that. Um, for friends who might just be drawing today, um, which is totally cool too. Um, you can have some markers and crayons um, and a pencil. And then, oh, and then you're gonna need a glue stick because we're gonna be doing some gluing. So, or if you have wet glue, that works too. Um, and yeah, let's get some inspiration going. I am just, I'm feeling so inspired by our beekeepers and how they were telling us how gardens and flowers um, are really important for bees because they need things to pollinate and they need that nectar. Um, but also, um, we can, we might see some bees and things, or excuse me, we might see some flowers and things that are in the stores and stuff. Those are a little bit different, but today we're getting our inspiration from the Smithsonian collection, but you might think of some flowers you see in your neighborhood or your parks. Um, these ones on our screen are from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And then that green background one is from um, my museum, the National Museum of African American History and culture um, with we are sharing a link with you um, where you can take a closer look at um, all of these flowers now or later but if you just look at your screen for a moment right now um, what do you notice about these flowers what do you see what colors what shapes do the flowers have how many flowers are there I'm noticing bunches of flowers and they all kind of mix together when I'm just looking at them. Um, but I do see some reds and oranges and yellows and pinks, some whites in there too, hmm, maybe a little bit of purple. And then a lot of the flowers are shapes kind of like circles. Can you see that circle I'm making? Um, but if you think too, sometimes flowers are a bunch of little ones on one stem or one big one on one stem, you might see some leaves. So I want you to keep all of those details in mind um, while we work on our collage today. Um, but for now, let's just get started. So when you're getting started, you are going to start with your blank piece of paper ready to go. And then one thing you'll notice is that in order to make our flowers, we need a lot of different pieces of paper. Um, and so right now, oh, some people might have scissors, but today I actually, I don't have my scissors, so I'm gonna mainly be tearing the pieces of paper. So let's see if you wanna do, let's say three flowers today, maybe we'll do three flowers, two or three. Um, and you can always, always, of course, add more because we know that bees need more. Um, and looking at your pieces of paper that you have, whether you have the colorful construction paper or you have your magazine paper, um, choose what color you're going to use for your petals of your flower. So these, these parts of the flower. 
I think I'm going to make a red flower, so I chose this paper that has mainly red on it. And I'm going to start tearing pieces. So I could make petals that are kind of like, let's see, kind of like long shaped petals, or I might tear bigger pieces. Let's see, they don't have to be perfect, you know. You could also use scissors, but I could tear a petal like that. And I might need, I might need like, maybe like five pieces for one flower sometimes. That seems like a good amount. What colors are you all gonna be using for your flowers today? I'm doing one red flower. And then think about, let's say one other flower color you might wanna do. If you have time for more, definitely do more. I think I wanna do a blue flower. So I'm gonna tear this and I think I'm gonna do strips. Like, oh, let's see. I tore this, but this is a little too big for my flower, so I'm gonna tear it into smaller pieces, like that. Or let's see, maybe if I show you, there you go, like a smaller piece. Okay. Maybe I do a little bit more. Ooh. Okay. All right, so I have some, let me see if you all can see that. Let me make sure you can see. No, you can't, okay. So I have some blue pieces here. I have some red pieces here. And then remember the center part of the flower that the bees are looking for, because that's where the nectar and the pollen that they're gonna be moving over is. Um, I usually, or sometimes it's yellow. So I'm using a yellow piece of paper and you're gonna tear just like small, a little small piece. You might just need one for each flower. So since I'm doing two flowers to start, I'm just gonna tear two small little pieces like that. Okay, what else do we need? Hmm, you definitely don't need to use a magazine. You can use colorful, pap colorful paper too, so. I think we need stems and leaves for our flowers, so you can use either some green paper. And the cool thing is if you if you tear them long ways, they kind of already tear into like a perfect stem shape like that. So you can tear them like that. Also, I'll just just to show a magazine like that. Um, okay. And then, oh, leaves. We need some leaves on our flowers. So those also can kind of be just little shapes. Let me see, little shapes like that. Okay. I think I have all the, all the pieces I need. Now, something that might be helpful, friends, if you're kind of, you might, let me not tear and talk at the same time. You might not be able to hear me. Um, you might want to draw where you're putting your flowers in case that helps your brain to know where to glue. So if I were doing mine, I'm gonna show you. One second. Now these don't look like much flowers yet, but this might help my brain to know that I wanna glue my stem on that line and that I wanna put my petals around this shape. That might help my brain a little bit, but you can also just start gluing. So let's take our glue sticks and um, you can either put it on the back of the magazine paper or the um, colorful paper or put it directly on top of your, um, your white paper, your paper that you're gluing on. So, which is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just follow the line I drew. But if you're not doing a line, no problem. And I'm gonna push my paper on there like that. Pretty, pretty good. 
I'm gonna start adding my petals. I'm realizing my petals are a little too big actually, so I'm tearing those even more. Now, we don't have a lot of time together today, but you know what? You can always keep going later and making sure you add more and more to your art. Don't just stop when we stop together. You can always keep doing it with your classmates, your friends, your family, on your own. So I have one flower glued down. I'm gonna do my other blue flower I made. And let's see. Some people are drawing their flowers and I think that's a really good idea too. Today we're just, you know what? Our goal is really just to celebrate flowers to remind us how important they are to bees, to make sure that they have flowers to pollinate for their <clears throat> for our food and for their for their lives too they need that not just to help us but we just want them to stay alive for themselves too right okay i have both of my flowers on there i need to add my yellow part i don't know where I made so many tearing, torn things, I don't even know where I put those ones I originally tore. Let me just make a quick one there. And, oh, it's stuck on my thumb. <laughs> okay, and there. Now, I know we, we brought some markers and crowns with us today, and I was thinking those would be really great for adding some bees to our paper. Um, so once you've added all your flowers, once you've added all of your flowers, um, you can add some bees on there or other pollinators. We learned that do that. So I put some, some yellow shapes right there and right there. And then, uh-oh, I don't have a black marker today. What? Okay, I'm gonna use brown, because that's okay. And draw my bees, I'm giving them stripes, because that's, I think that's one of those classic things. I gave them little stingers too. What do you think about that? I think those bees look like they're about to pollinate my flowers that I put on there. Huh, well, I wonder, friends, what kinds of flowers these ones are. These ones are just a red and a blue one, but there are so many different kinds of flowers, and I'm sure on your side of the screen, you are making flowers of all different colors and shapes and sizes. I can't wait to add a few more down here later, but when you're done, if it's right now, if it's later, if it's tomorrow, if it's another time entirely, please feel free to share your flowers um, that your classroom and your family made today. Um, we would love to see them. You can show them to us on social media using the hashtag, hashtag Namak Kids, or tagging the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, or you can just send me an email. I would love to get an email as well. Um, you can check out the info for that in the chat. Um, I'd also really love to hear how this program was for you today. If you have feedback um, for me or for or want to say anything to our special guests, I'll make sure they get that information too. Um, I can't wait to read some of those responses. Um, it was really, really, really fun learning together with you today and creating some flowers with you. Um, thank you so much for joining me to celebrate Black History Month. Black History Month is awesome because so many people love to use this month to learn Black stories, celebrate Black people, and remember Black history. But you know what? 
because there are so many incredible things about our history and culture, we learn about it and celebrate it all year long at our museum. So please be sure to visit us and join us for more programs throughout the rest of the year too, not just February. I hope you'll also come learn with us next Friday, February 9th. We will be meeting some awesome black divers from Black Girls Dive and making an under the sea inspired watercolor painting. Until then, stay curious and remember to celebrate you too. See you next time.